Hey and welcome to this TJ Digital video on photogrammetry. I'm going to be showing you the basics of photogrammetry using a software called Photoscan by Agisoft. And you can try this yourself. All you need is a decent digital camera and you can download a trial version of the program. So let's get started. I just wanted to show you this model first. This is about the results you can expect from the Agisoft Photoscan process. The model is about half a million triangles and there's no lighting going on here, so this is the texture as it is. To do a self-portrait like I did, you're going to need a friend to help you snap the photos. For best results, use a prime lens as close to 50 millimeters as possible. If you don't have a prime lens, use a zoom lens and try to keep it fully zoomed in or out to minimize the risk of accidentally zooming with the lens during a session. When taking the photos, set your camera to manual mode and leave no setting to be automatically adjusted. The reason for this is that you might get shots where your subject seems differently lit depending on the metering mode adjustment of your camera based on the entire image, such as varying dark or light backgrounds. Try to get a sharp image with little or no noise. Preferably, shoot with RAW if possible for further tweaking possibilities on the computer later on. Take lots of photos, better too many than too few. Take both from eye level, below and above to get as many angles as possible. Here are the photos I used for the 3D model I showed you earlier on. As you can see, these photos are taken outdoors and intentionally on a cloudy day. The reason for this is that you want even light on your subject. If you're not able to take your photos on a cloudy day, try to do it in the shade perhaps a shadow of a building or something similar. If you are to do it indoors, the same principle applies. Try to do it in an evenly lit environment. Remember, you want to take many photos. Take them from eye level, below and above, and you can even go for detail shots. The principle of Photoscan is that we're going to feed all of these images into the software and it's going to analyze all of the photos and try to find as many unique tracking points as possible, such as, let's say, your eyes or your nose. And it's going to try to find these unique tracking points in as many photos as possible. And with all of this data, it's going to generate a point cloud. Initially, we'll just have a sparse point cloud, which is a few thousand points. But beyond that, we can continue to compute the data and get a dense point cloud, which means we'll have millions of points. And the cool thing about all of these points is that they also inherit color information from the photos. So we'll be able to make a fairly high detailed model, but we'll also get all of that color information which we can use to create a texture, which is really cool. So I'll show you how to do this next. So this is Photoscan. And before we get started, I want to show you some advice which is going to speed up your workflow. Uh, if you go to Tools and Preferences, there's this one tab called OpenCL. And with OpenCL, you can utilize your graphics card to compute all of the, the algorithms and whatnot which is going on in the program. So you'll see your graphics card listed here. Uh, check that you want to use your graphics card. And as advice down here, you want to step back on one core of your CPU. So I've got initially eight CPU cores and eight uh, GPU cores. And I enable these eight GPU cores and step back one step here. So I have a total of 15 cores going on here. Right. So what's nice about Photoscan is that you've got this menu called Workflow and uh, all of these options are going to be enabled one by one as you step through them and when you have finished down here to build texture you've pretty much got a nice 3D model. Of course there's other things you can do as well but I'm just going to go through these basics with you. So I'll click add photos and I'll add these photos which I showed you earlier. And it's worth mentioning that at this point you could open the raw images from your DSLR and you could try to tweak the images to, to get better results in Photoscan. Such as let's say removing uh, noise and maybe sharpening the image, adding a bit of contrast as well. As well. And um, yeah, can be worth a try. But for show I'm just going to use the JPEG straight out of the camera. Right, so now I've added the images, you can see them popping up down here. I've now got something called Chunk 1 here with 41 cameras, and the, those cameras are actually my photos. 
what I'm going to do now is go to the workflow menu again and now I'm able to click this here option called align photos and here you can choose accuracy and yeah high is going to give you better results but it's also going to take a lot more time to compute so you can go ahead and try high or medium and whatnot just keep in mind that it does take a long time to always go for the best options and it's not always necessary unless you've got really really sharp images so yeah i'm going to try high here yep here we go. Uh, it's going to have different steps here and you've got this overall progress here. Um, it could actually take quite some time so you might want to go get a drink or something and check back on the computer. So I'll see you in a bit. So now the alignment process is done and you can see several points and all of these blue planes out here in this big viewport. If you check to the left, you'll now see that you have something called tie points and 6,000 of them, or at least in my case, 6,000. These are all of those unique tracking points which the software has managed to, to identify. So if you just left click out here, you can rotate the view and you can navigate around. Um, all of these blue planes uh, you mill mouse button drag to pan. So all of these blue planes are actually the camera positions of where the camera was uh, uh, positioned when that certain photo was taken. You can uh, enable viewing these cameras with this button so it might be easier to disable it at times just to easier see all of the points and what's going on there. Uh, you can also see that I've got a lot of the background going on as well. And since I'm not trying to import the background, but rather my head, uh, I want to go ahead and delete all of these other points. So the easiest way to do that is to use one of these here selection modes, for instance, the freeform select tool. Um, and I'll just drag around the part I want to keep. So I'll go something like this. You can just go quite rough and then click this here crop tool and what that does is deletes all of the other points except those that were selected and uh, at this point I'm going to go back to the select navigation tool um, I have to go back to this tool actually to navigate the camera around since uh, I use left click to rotate the camera with this one and left click selects with these so same thing here go ahead and delete these points which you don't want uh, either use the crop again or just select points and then click delete and at this point I'm just going to zoom in and um, select certain points and delete them um, now I'm not sure but I think uh, per default when you install the program you'll have a light gray background uh, I found out that in the preferences of the program you can change the background color and in my case since the subject me that is um, uh, I'm, I have quite light points here, so it's easier to see them in contrast to dark background, so that might help you out. So I'm just real quickly going to go through here and delete some of these here floating points. Um, the more and the better you can delete, the, the more accurate uh, mesh and further dense date that you're going to get. Um, if you do have these floating around at the point when you're going to create your mesh, uh, you will get some odd shapes and whatnot going on. Uh, with your head. So yeah, uh, bear with me here and I'm just gonna select a few of these points and we'll proceed to the next step uh, which is to create this here uh, dense point cloud. So um, yeah, let's see. Um, I've probably gotten most of the points I need to delete now but hey, I'll just do this really quickly and let's proceed after that. So I'll just get that last point there, right. So um, that seems quite nice uh, to me, um, yeah, uh, some more floaters, <laughs> go figure, I think I saw some here over by the nose here as well, yep, let's uh, delete those as well, there we go, fine, um, I'm going to leave it be now. So next step, uh, go into the workflow menu again and now after you've aligned the photos you can see that you can build this dense cloud. You can actually build a mesh at this point, uh, but I do recommend that you do the dense cloud uh, part because that's going to further improve and add even more points and you'll get a better mesh if you do proceed to the dense cloud. So let's go dense cloud. 
Same thing here. Uh, you can choose from this drop down. Uh, it takes a lot of time, really, really long time if you go ultra high. So I'd not recommend you to do recommend you to do that the first thing you try out. Uh, do try it if you have really good uh, data, but uh, I think high is going to be certainly good enough for this case. Uh, let's see. Yeah, you can you can leave the depth filtering at aggressive. Uh, I've been told that this is the most useful one. Uh, if you do have really high quality photos with lots and lots of data going on already, you can drop this down to moderate perhaps. So I'll just leave the, this at the default aggressive and go with high. So uh, same thing as last time, it's going to have several steps here and it's going to take some time here as well. So I'll see you guys in a bit. So now the dense cloud generation is done and you can see that I've now got this dense cloud here under my chunk one and it's got almost 9 million points. So that's a whole lot more points than my prior 4,500 points. And to visualize this dense cloud, you can cl click this button up here. And as you can see, I've now got a whole lot going on here. Um, it's really starting to look like me. Uh, I have to zoom really, really close to even be able to tell that these are individual points. So uh, what you need to do at this point is to once again clean up any excess points that you might have, such as these floaters over here. So um, I'll just take a quick look around the model, see if I find any floating points and just remove those. Uh, and there's a few here. Um, and it's worth taking your time and doing this properly because this is the last and final step before we proceed to generating a mesh from all of these points. And if you do have some of these points um, floating around, uh, you're going to get some weird parts on the mesh uh, where the mesh is going to connect to these points which are not uh, desirable. So I'll just um, have a quick look all the way around. Um, yep, there are some points over there as well. And um, I think the better uh, job I do at the sparse point uh, step, I won't get as many of these floaters in the dense uh, cloud generation. But so far, I've always gotten a few extra floaters during this point uh, <laughs> step, actually. Uh, right, so I'll just remove these last few parts here. Um, I do have this big hole in my head <laughs> and I don't necessarily think it's because um, I'm missing photos from that angle. I don't have any directly from above but I think it might also be due to the fact that it's hard for the photo, uh, the camera or sorry the software to, to find any unique points in this big area here because it pretty much looks all the same to the software I, I guess. So yeah. Um, I think I'm quite happy with how this looks. Um, so let's proceed to the next step. And the next step is to go to the workflow menu once again and click build mesh. And at this point, um, you've got this uh, quality slider again. And once again, uh, this one is going to give you um, higher results or actually more polygons, as you can see, 1.8 billion. And it's going to take longer. In my experience, this one here, which is uh, around half a million, is going to work out just fine. It will be easier to work in the 3D software as well, which is in my case Maya, because performance-wise this is going to be easier to work with when doing retopology. Um, you can go to advanced and it might be worth mentioning that um, I've changed to this one called extrapolated and this one is going to, to really make an effort to try to close any holes or gaps while this one um, just does it to some degree. So you can try both of them out but uh, I do prefer this one in most cases. So I'm going to hit OK here and once again uh, we've got this process bar indicating different steps and even this step is going to take some time so I'll see you guys in a few. So now the 3D model is done. You can see I've now got a 3D model out here at 600,000 faces. I can also view a few different 3D modes here. I've got this uh, shaded one, solid one and wireframe one. And eventually once I've built my texture I can also view the texture version here as well. So the next step is to go to the workflow menu once again. And this is the last step in Agisoft which I'm going to go through. And that is build texture. 
Um, there's a few mapping modes. Uh, I usually leave it that generic. To be honest, I haven't tried the other ones. Uh, blending mode. Um, I have tried this mosaic and average. And uh, I actually blended between these two for the results I showed you in Maya earlier. Um, yeah, and there's the resolution as well, of course. Worth noting is that the default UV layout for this uh, high poly model we're generating is a really, really exploded um, UV set. So you'll have lots and lots and lots of small fragments of faces. So you really want to have a high resolution here, both to get high detail, of course, but also to compensate for uh, all that uh, wasted space in the UV uh, layout which is automatically generated so i'll go for 8k here and i'll hit ok uh, once again we have this here step of generating the data um, this one doesn't take as long as the other ones but as before i'll see you guys in a while the texture generation process is now done and i can now enable this fourth viewing mode here which is going to show me my 3d model with the texture on top Keep in mind that this is not being lit in real time, this is just purely the texture being shown on the high poly model. And we're now ready to export this into our 3D package. In my case I'm going to show it how it looks like in Autodesk Maya. So you can go to Tools and Export and select Export... Um, Oh no, sorry. You can export your texture from there. You right click this model and you go Export Model. Uh, I think I'll just throw this into here and I'll call it um, lecture export 01. You'll be prompted uh, with this here dialog and you can export your texture here as well if you've created the texture as we did just before. So um, I think I'll go with TIFF or maybe PNG. Don't go with JPEG as that is a um, a format which will give you artifacts. It's a destructive format. So hit OK here and this will be quite quick in comparison to the rest of the progress bars all along the way. And uh, yeah, as soon as this is done, there we go. Uh, let's jump into Maya. I just imported the model from Agisoft Photoscan. It's about half a million triangles and I'm showing the texture as it is right now with no lighting. If I turn on lighting, you can see that you can expect to get some form of jaggedness like this. I still think that this is perfectly fine to do retopology work on. And if you want, you can use the Sculpt Geometry tool to smooth this out a bit. But I don't think that's actually necessary. So, I hope you enjoyed the video. Please let us know what you thought about the video and what you want to see next. To see more, visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter.